So, so I started out, you know, doing weddings, uh, playing singing bands, and I, I just took everything I got called for, and then I would do, uh, you know, the other gigs that that didn't pay anything, you know. And uh, at that time, the uh, Internet Cafe was uh, right. just getting going. So, at the time at Tony Malaby, uh, we would play there quite a bit, and we would practice together and did, how, did you meet Formanac around this time or yeah that's about the, around the time I met Formanac it's funny because like my I got asked to do a, a, a steeplechase record I did a steeplechase record for somebody it might have been Steve Lespina and then Niels asked me to do a record that's a whole nother long story but anyway I ended up doing it and I said uh, well I got this quartet with uh, Mike Formanac Tony Malaby and Jeff Williams and I said we play together all the time. It's great. We got all the music memorized. Would be cool. And it's like okay, great. Let's do it, right? And I had heard that Paul Blay would go in and just improvise on these records and give them title because he the publishing thing's a mess. And you know, I got advice like don't give him your publishing. So, so I told him that. And those three guys had a gig at the Internet Cafe the night before the session because they were a trio. So I went to the gig. And I sat there, both sets, I just kind of like imagined myself playing with them, right, blah, blah, blah. Then the next day we go to a recording session and we improvised like just about everything on the record. There's a couple things that, that aren't improvised, but that had heads just because we wanted to kind of give, help the illusion more. And, um, and so we're playing all these improvised things and, and Niels is in the booth, oh, that's great, oh, that's great music, oh, really, <laughs> you know, and so he kind of thought everything was all figured out. And, didn't know we were improvising, I well. guess, but and but that worked out. That's kind of how I met Mike. Okay, so that. you never. Okay, got it. I hadn't right. really. I don't think I really worked with him before that. Okay. At some point, you got your own Forty Second Street. Yeah. So you're really entrenched in the commercial thing, but then doing all this cool, crazy, original music. Yeah. Well, did you feel pulled in any? In any way? Not at first. Um, you know, you got people on both sides that would kind of, you know, give you a hard time about it a little bit. You know, like, a, you know, some, some guys on the uh, creative music side were like, I'd rather do a day gig than something like a show or a wedding because it's going to, right. you know. And then, like, there would be guys at shows that'd be like, why are you taking off to do a gig that doesn't pay anything? Because I need it's my sanity. I need to do this. It's not what I moved to New York for. So it became over the uh, over the years. It became kind of clear that like I should keep my mouth shut when I'm in both circles, because the commercial guys they were there to do that. And if you weren't there to do that, you probably shouldn't be there, mm. right? You know what I mean? They were like, I and I, I caught some shit sometimes from people. Yeah, I feel you know? that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It's better. Yeah. It's better to be quiet about that. Like, I, uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I get a little, kind of pushy sometimes. And like, there was a couple sax players that I would like, say, Hey, have you heard this guy Joe Maneri? And they would be like, What was that? Never heard of him. Can he play? You know? And uh, these guys, they, they call, they think they're, they're hardcore, hardcore jazz players, right? And so I give them a CD. Joe Maneri and they'd be like that guy can't play I'd be like, the hell he can't Are you kidding me he's one of oh, my heroes funny. so that kind of you know stoked the wrong thing oh, that's know? interesting so at some point played with Dewey Redman yeah and I like tell me about well I met Cameron Brown we were both teaching at a workshop in in Italy and we became pretty good friends and Sheila Jordan was was there too so I got to know them pretty well, and so it was 1997, and Cameron was going to put out his first record as a leader, and so he chose the band to be Dewey and Sheila and Leon Parker, and he started rehearsing stuff, and there was a lot of tension because Leon was like, had he was in Dewey's band, and he wasn't in it, he was trying to be his own leader, oh. and Dewey you know, a new Cameron as a sideman in his band. So there was all kind of like weird dynamics that was kind of under the sort. And Cameron was, so at one point he, he asked me to come to a rehearsal. So I went to this rehearsal and then Sheila's like, he's got to be on this. He's got to be in this band, you know, because I was kind of like the equalizer for a minute. And I didn't realize what I was walking into. But anyway, so 
that was the band. It was uh, Cameron's, the, what's on Cameron's records. He's, there's two volumes. Uh, it's called The Here and Now. We did a two-week tour in, um, in Belgium. That was the, uh, how, what they recorded that made the record. I got to hang out with him and play with him. Like, it was kind of like, I mean, it was some heavy moments when, like, you know, there's no chords and we're playing a ballad and, like, for all we know, right? And I have to play after Sheila sings before Dewey comes in. Or Sheila sings, Dewey plays, I have to play. And they're not doubling the tempo at all. Like, that was their thing. No double timing. Like, so the ballad's like... Hmm. And it's like, holy sh... I mean, Dewey was like, he sounded amazing. He could play anything. You know, hmm. people would give him shit about, he couldn't play changes or this or that. That's, that's ridiculous. He, he, the guy was amazing. Cool. And, you know, he told me some cool things. Like, uh, he told me, like, if I got my sound, I can do anything. I got to get my sound. I mean, I, I agree with that, I, th yeah. I think, right? Yeah. That's I, amazing. I, it took me a while to really understand what he was talking about, but I think I understand it now all these years later about that, that I have had some experiences now where when, when you get that sound that is you, it doesn't matter what you're playing. You're playing in the moment, and it's really oh, I could, it's an yeah. amazing experience. Mm. I could see why that was his, that was his, uh, that was his default. That's what he... He wanted, and now the more that I've, I didn't, I hadn't like done a deep dive on him before I started playing with him. But you know, now since then, I've listened to like a lot of the things that he did, and I can hear, you know, now I'm listening with those ears to like to be like that. Yeah. Work on that. What What are some of your things you work on all the time? Primarily sound and rhythm. Yeah, like I always had really bad time. Like I, 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 well, that's one thing I learned when I went to Berkeley. Was like everybody's like, you got to work on your time. Mm. I'm like, what do you mean? I don't. I, I didn't know what they were talking about. I said, if you don't work on your time, it's going to come back and hurt you. And uh, then I, then Bob Galati was huge, man. Bob Galati helped me a lot to even just realize what that meant. And uh, he was a great teacher too. So he, I didn't take lessons with him. I got to play with him. So he, and he really drew the distinction, like if you were playing with him, he wasn't going to talk to you like a teacher, you know, which is another great teaching thing to learn, right? Mm. If you're not my student, I'm not going to te talk to you like a teacher, you know, that, that's a different thing. But he really helped me to understand what that meant. And then there were some gigs along the way, like one of the biggest ones was uh, this guy, Rabi Abu Khalil, who's an oud player. Uh, he lives in Munich, but he was recording for Enja. And I was lucky enough to get on a record of, that he did with five uh, American horn players in his band. And everything, you know, the music was like in 1016. Right? So it's like a, what he calls a Georgina. And so it was all these odd meters, not shifting odd meters, just like the Middle Eastern thing. And, uh, but the hard part was like the trumpets, like the trumpet parts were like, you know, you didn't have like, don't, 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 you'd have that, yeah. Ka, a, a. Uh, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, where do I put it? You know, mm -hmm. so like I've, I literally made a sequencer of all the music and just listened to it over and over and over and over. And I studied and I studied and I studied. And then I got the music together. And then we go play with the band. He had a hand drummer, a guy who played a Rick, who was from uh, Syria, who he put a swing on it. So it was always like there, you had to it like kind of, different. yeah, so it wasn't like metronomic in the mm. way that the sequencer was playing, but at least that prepared me to be able to listen and play with that guy. Uh, so it was weird because like rhythm is like, yeah, you got to get the metronomic rhythm stuff together, but then you got to be willing to let it go forward or backwards as it needs, mm. you know. Another one is playing with Hollenbeck really helped my time a lot too mm. because, a lot, you know, being a drummer, I mean, a lot of his music is not, but doesn't sound like a drummer. But some of his music has, like, definitely a drummer um, approach to it. And I would, like, listen to, you know, some of the music he, uh, he'd be playing. And I would look over at him, and I'd be like, that guy's not counting. He's just playing, right? And I'd be, okay. So, I, you know, counting is the first step to getting it. But then you got to keep go working with it till you get to that point where you're not counting it anymore. 
but it's still in the right place, you know. So, but you can't start there, <laughs> you know. Yeah, so, right. you know, some people think you could just jump in there, but anyway. So that I was, I had to work on my time because that was like it, work on kind, my time all yeah, the time. Yeah, what kinds of things do you do to work on your time? You know, it's evolved over time. It depends on you know if I have a specific piece I have to learn that has something like that. I work on that. I mean, the most basic thing you start doing is like playing tunes with the Metro Mon 2 and 4, keeping the form and all that. That's very important. Doing it on 1 and 3, very important. Then doing it on bigger beats, doing it on 1s, mm -hmm. doing it on 1 of every 2 bars, those mm -hmm. kind of things. I like to invent exercises for things that I need to work on, right, rather than go find a book. So one of the exercises I'm doing now, I've done it for a while, is an articulation exercise where you just start off playing quarter notes, then you play eighth notes, then you, and it's all one note, then eighth note triplets, then sixteenth notes, then eighth note triplets, eighth notes, quarter notes. Actually, it's similar to what Mark Giuliano exercise he does when he came here and showed us this. So then I've evolved that into quarter note, quarter note triplets, eighth notes, fives, and you're, sixes, you're playing sevens. up a, like a, a pattern or something? and Just one line, one note. A one note. Dot, 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 and then backwards, you know. So I'll, I've made up a, I just made up an exercise moving through the horn doing that. And then that, you know, will evolve into other things. Another one would be, uh, I've made up an exercise of four bar phrases, like four, four, four mm -hmm. bars, three, four, five, four, three, four, 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 and you got to improvise going back and forth between the. the and and it's four, so four bars, four each bars, bar each is a different bar, is a different time signature. Each four bars is a different time ah, signature. okay. Right, so you got to really get in the four, four, three, four. Five four. Then you gotta go three four four four. And the hard part is you always go to five four four four. <laughs> you keep forgetting to. So I, every time I make up an exercise, I try to throw a little wrinkle in it that I have to really think about. Oh, that's great. But then it takes forever to learn them, you know. So it's like, <laughs> you know, and you do them with a metronome, without a metronome, different tempos. Uh, sometimes it's just, you know, that same exercise I'll practice just playing dotted quarters through the whole thing. Oh right. You know. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, and you, you know, a lot of times I have to sit down and write it out and figure out what the math is and. Boom, then I just you come up with an exercise and work on it. But the idea to get it past the point that I'm thinking about it, mm -hmm. that I'm feeling it. Mm -hmm. in the, when you're in the moment playing with people, I noticed really great drummers, they're, they're listening and playing. They're not really counting or, or mm -hmm. thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, the great recordings like Miles' you know, uh, 60s quintet, you know, there's like a 16th note, 8th note here and there added, you know, Keith Jarrett's trio. They're, you know, it's, yeah. it, you know, if you sit down with a slide rule, it may not fit, but <laughs> that's not the point. Sure. But yeah. I want to have, I want to be comfortable so that I can have, I can engage when things happen like that. You know, like uh, one of the last records I did with, my, well, the last record I did with Mario Pavone was with Tyshawn Sori and Matt Mitchell. And the music was very open. But I, I, I was, I, I was, I was glad that I could find the space to like not. I found another space in there because I, w I wasn't thrown by what they were playing. I'm not saying I knew where one was every time or anything like that, but I could hear what was going on and have a response to it. When you're playing this music, there's going to be moments you're uncomfortable. That's that's okay. You want to embrace that. But the thing is, when you get uncomfortable. Usually, your first response is, "Oh, I got to get in there. I got to figure out what they're doing. I got to do it." And that's the wrong response, especially like as a horn player, because that's the rhythm section. They got the percolating. You have to find another spot, right? And that so this practice helped me kind of listen and find that other spot. I really like that recording. I think that came off really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, I was also but what you just said reminded me of. Um a Hombeck thing, he was talking about playing free and how each person kind of plays in their own sandbox a little bit. It's not so much that you're like trying to like yeah. get in somebody else's sandbox. That's a really important thing to think about when you're when you talk about improvising is because um, 
Disparate things can exist at the same time, and that's much more interesting than follow the leader. The skills you need, you need to be able to hear and you know, be able to match pitch is a good thing to be able to do on mm -hmm. your instrument. But you don't, that's only so that you can recognize when unisons happen. Because when you're improvising freely, unisons are kind of gold, right? They really bring the, inst the listener to, whoa, there it is. But that's not necessarily the goal. That's just something, another thing you want to be comfortable with. So yeah, these different things going on at the same time create the interest and they create the tension. And they, you know, when you're, when you're listening to, to improvise music, you're trying to organize it in your head, right? Because that's what we do as humans is try to organize things. You know, you look at a cloud in the sky, right? You go, oh, it looks like an uh, a scorpion or something, right? And it, it's just a cloud, you know? Right. And, but, so the same with the music. It's just the sound, but we're trying to organize it. So when these things, when, when somebody really digs into this and the other person digs into this, that creates the identity of the two things. Instead of like, you know, kind of quitting and going here, you know? So that's a really important concept that he uses. Really notice this in the macro quartet. Yeah. I mean, the two of you, Herb and you, play so well together. It's astounding. Thanks. I mean, that's, Herb's one of my heroes. The story about Herb is that when I joined Artists in Blue, these guys were like, Herb Robertson, Herb Robertson, Herb Robertson. I go, who's Herb Robertson? I never heard of him, you know. I was like, you know, okay. And uh, we did a tour, uh, the, you know, the Canadian Jazz Festival tours that used to happen. Okay. Anyway, we were playing at Vancouver Jazz Festival, and they were like, Herb's playing an afternoon concert with Bobby Previtt, Mark uh, Dresser, and uh, Walter Virbaus. And I'm like, I don't know any of those guys, <laughs> but Herb's, I'll go check him out. So I'm sitting there, and they start playing, and I'm like, this is the biggest bunch of <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. And then about an hour later, I was like, that is the greatest <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> That's right. It was, because it, it, it hit me, because it was like, it was, Herb is the, I mean, other people will tell you this too. He's the greatest living improviser hmm. there is right now. Hmm. I mean, he is, this guy is pure improvising. So I, so I, you know, we had met and we, you know, uh, we played, he played in Orange and Blue for a while and we played uh, with a woman named uh, Sadako Fuji. Mm. Um, we played in her band a lot and, and we'd always, you know, talked. I would always pick his brain and he's a very interesting guy. So at one point I, I said, I will, you know, I'd like to do a project with you and so we, sat down we talked about it and we came up with this idea for this quartet and actually that was recorded in 2007 what yeah oh yeah wow. it was first the first it's a double cd the first cd was re, is the first set and i mean it's it all it's all released as it happened so but the first set was uh released about 2009 and then that record label went bust and uh, Adam Hopkins started a label and he was like looking for things to do. And I said, well, I have this second set that's never been rele released. And so he agreed to put out both of them together. Mm. And that's what came out in 2020, uh, okay. which we had like, uh, actually had a bunch of really good gigs set up that got canceled because of COVID, uh, right. which is kind of uh. like the track record of that band. But the best story about that band, I got to tell you is that like, so we're gonna do the gig at the Stone and we're gonna record it. And uh, so we show up and Tom's there and Drew's there and Herb and me and, and Herb and I have written this music, right? And, uh, but you know, it was all graphic scores. It was that kind of stuff. And we give it to Tom, we give it to Drew and Tom, so great. Tom looks at it and he goes, really? <laughs> Re really? <laughs> we, we don't need this, we're improvisers. So we, all right, end of rehearsal, we went and got dinner and we came back and played the gig. You know? <laughs> I think you mentioned you write very quickly, but you think about it yeah. a lot. Yeah. Do you have like a, like a notepad or something well, that you write so ideas yeah. on? Or? So first of all, for me, there is no difference between composing and improvising. Okay. It's the same thing. The time scale is different, right? Improvising, I have right now. Composing, I have as, as long as I want. But the process is the same, and working with the materials is is pretty similar too. So. I, this is one of the things I've been practicing. Is that uh, this is this? I've been doing this for a whole year now. Okay. And I fin I filled up one notebook already. Okay. But um, 
it kind of started when Oliver Lake came to visit here. Kind of, he didn't do this, but it kind of got me thinking about this. So what I do is like every day, I make a little cell, and I practice it. And so like you know this particular one, I I just was like, okay, all the notes that all the chords that G can be part of, and then made random uh, little uh, progressions and just kind of played around that. But really, the one that the thing that became very helpful was when um, okay, there's a little rhythm thing I just write out. Okay. <laughs> but uh, like today's is just this uh, uh, seven, five, uh, I guess eight note line okay. phrase. And so what I'm doing is like I'm I'm using it as a long tone exercise, as an ear training exercise, and. Um, so I'll, t I'll play it, but I'll move it around to different pitches. Mm -hmm. I'll play it backwards. I'll invert it. And th how this connects to composition is it's really the same kind of process when I compose. I come up with something to get started. Might be the idea of what the piece is. You know, what, what am I writing for? Uh, that's usually the most important thing, right? You know, like, who am I writing for? What's, what am I writing for? And then, um, then I'll start off just getting something that's an idea because once you got that idea then it's like I mean there's so many things you can do to it that mm -hmm. it's it's just becomes a point of making decisions right that is amazing I what it ends up leading to is um, improvising from that like by you know having if I if I get into it and say it's like a, a structure. Sometimes I'll, I'll use rows, like longer structures. Sometimes I use shorter structures. The shorter structures work much better than the longer ones. But I'll start off, it's kind of interesting. Like, I mean, yes, I'm thinking this through as I'm practicing it, like playing it. Just I play it and play it really slow until I hear it. I hear it coming out. Then I'll try to move it to another note until I hear it coming out. And then maybe I'll go backwards. You know, maybe um, all the time I'm kind of varying the rhythm. And what I found was that that's sneaking into my improvisation now. And so now I'm finding that my improvisations have much more shape and structure and melody to them than they used to oh, from this practice. And it, so it's almost like the compositional practice, like you're saying, you're just using that material. And then, you know, once you start like turning it inside out, and upside down, it's, it starts to transform. I kind of intellectually thought of this, this, there's a connection years ago about, um, Arnold Schoenberg would talk about this thing about called de developing variations, where, and he points to Brahms as writing like this, where he, there, uh, he's a famous essay that Schoenberg wrote called the Brahms and the, I forgot the name of the actual article, but it's about developing variations in Brahms, basically the idea that the very first thing the piece grows out of the first thing. And I always thought that would be a great concept to, to use for improvisation. That the, not that you have to refer back to the first thing, but that the first thing makes the piece grow, right? And so this is, these little cells kind of like can be the beginning of that kind of thing. And what I found was that that is kind of sneaking into the improvisation. The key I found is that I got to get it to where I'm hearing it coming out. It can't just be an intellectual process that I'm thinking about. It, it is in the beginning, right? Like, oh, is that a minor third? Did I hear that right? Is that minor third? And then I move it to another note. And I am thinking, the interval, what's, okay, what's that interval? Can, then, you know, what if I turn that minor third into a major sixth? Okay, well, then just kind of, okay, what does that sound like? And sound like, you know, so you keep playing it, keep playing it till you hear it come out. It's also building chops because I, to do this on the trumpet, again, you got to really, everything's got to be working right. You gotta get the ear working right, the embouchure and the pivots, all that stuff has to be working right for this to be, you have that beautiful cleanness to it. I found that through this process, I, I don't have to fill up as much space. Does that make sense? I think so. Before, what I would like write, everything would be sound so dense and complicated, but now through this process, going slow and really just listening, I found that there's more space in what I'm composing I'm more comfortable with the space. I don't know if that makes sense, but it just kind of feels like it went there. You That's know, cool. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna yeah, I'm gonna steal that idea. It's too. pretty fun, yeah. you know, because like so I have my routine now is like this little warm up, and then that that 
tonguing exercise I told you about, and then yeah. this, mm. you know, and it's like, wow, after like, you know, 45 minutes, you know, if I've, if I can't get any more time in practicing, that's, a, if I get at least that, it's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> what would you tell yourself, like a, a younger Dave Blue? What would you tell a younger Dave Blue? That's a good question. Well, it's hard to answer that question without thinking back and thinking about like how I wish I had acted differently in different situations, uh. you know. I think about this a lot, actually. If I was able to say something that would have registered at that age, I would say everything's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, I, I don't get asked to do a lot of these things too much, but I did get asked to do something at, at the University of New Hampshire a few years ago, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't know this was going to happen, but one of the guys was like, okay, we're going to do a workshop, but I'm just going to interview you. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Okay. And the last thing he said was, you know, there's like 30 kids there. He says, what would be, the la what would be something you would have said to yourself when you were here? And I said, it's going to be okay. And everybody was like, well, that's a downer. <laughs> like, I wanted something, <laughs> some brilliant like thing, well, that is, but I don't know. But it's true because I think there's a lot of anxiety. I see that in my kids. Teach when I'm teaching. There's like, there's a lot of anxiety. I said this to my kids the other day, and I was like, I can't believe I said this, but I said, we live in the richest country in the world. We we could turn on the water, and it's going to be there. You know, we, there's things that we have that people in the, in the rest of this world don't have, mm. and yet we're the most anxious. If I was, you know, what I would say to myself as younger it would be like, you know, it's okay to trust people. Mm. You know, yes, there's going to people let you down. Yes, mm. there's going to be that happen. It's not a big deal. Everything's going to be okay. Because I was very, I think I was very cautious, and I think I, I think I lost some opportunities because I was. I wasn't willing to trust people, you know. Interesting. And I know that's probably, you know, you asked what I would tell Dave Ballou, so I told Dave Ballou, you know. Hey, yeah. But, but you know, this the thing that I noticed is that, um, like, I like to practice. I, I practice every day, and that's kind of like my little sanctuary. But it's hard to get out and be with people. You know, I, I'm kind of an introvert. But um, this music, you need to get out and be with people. You know, mm -hmm. you need it's 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 a social thing. Whether it's three people or two people hanging out in a room, it, it's people interacting, right? When I'm playing music, I'm, you know, I'm playing for an audience. Whether it's one person or fifty people, you know, and that uh, you know, I get sometimes you get criticism. I get criticism but that the music I play is way over their heads and stuff. I'm like, no, it's just I'm playing for them. You know, it's coming from here. It's an offering. It's not. I'm not trying to entertain them. I'm not trying to. I'm trying to give them something that's that's personal that maybe they can relate to if they're open to it. That's a trust thing. The great musicians, the ones that I see, the ones that I've seen through my generation that have become not just popular but are really great musicians, they have that trust. They're willing, they're willing to go anywhere and, and, and hang with people and be open, and it's okay. Yeah. Well, th thanks for this interview, and Thank thanks you. for talking to me. Could I, could I twist your arm to play one more? You don't have to twist my arm, let's play two.
Yeah, man. Yeah. Whew. That's fun. That's really fun. Yeah. We need to do more of this. Well, that was super fun for me. I hope you got a lot out of that. Um, if you did, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And thanks for dropping by.